Hello, Facebook friends and family. How are you today? Welcome, um, I am Suzette Martinez Valderez, Republican candidate for US Congress in California's 25th Congressional District. I am running to unseat the liberal progressive Katie Hill, um, who last year, unfortunately, um, uh, beat our wonderful Congressman Steve Knight. Um, this is, welcome to my office again this year, guys, or this uh, week, guys. Um, I didn't get my table. Uh, it's not it's not in yet, so I don't have a kitchen table. Um, but as soon as I get it, you guys are welcome to it. This is my sixth, sixth Facebook Live town hall, and I can't believe it's it's already there. It's already been a month and a half of these. They've been so fun. They've been a huge opportunity to get to know um, so many of my neighbors and community members. Uh, a really funny story. Today I was talking to my dad, and um, who who is is helping me fundraise by calling uh, some of his friends. He, um, you know, he's a auto mechanic in San Fernando, and one of his friends um, came to his shop today. And I guess he found out that, um, or his friend or his client came to his shop today, and his client uh, found out he found out that his client lives in Acton, and he um, told he told him, oh, well, my daughter lives in Acton, and my daughter is actually running for U.S. Congress, and um, <laughs> the guys, the client said, the guy says, "Yeah, I know who she is. I watch her every Wednesday." So a part of me feels like I have this Wednesday uh, reality show, I guess now, but it's not, it's 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 serious reality because we are truly looking at some serious issues that Washington is facing and we don't have a representative that rep represents our values. And it's just so encouraging to know that there are so many individuals out there engaged in, in this congressional race so early um, that you guys are paying attention to my town halls, that you are using it as an opportunity to learn more about me, to ask me questions. So welcome, uh, Jeremiah, oh, Jeremiah. And I met for the first time last night, or I'm not sorry, last night, the previous night at the Antelope Valley Republican Assembly, which was just a phenomenal meeting. You guys um, check it out on my Facebook page. We did a Facebook Live there. And Gayla, Gayla, welcome. Uh, Donald, um, ha ha. Donald, yes, I was just watching the first Democratic pre uh, presidential debate and, um, uh, I think I both did laugh and did good and and, and cried. Uh, I agree with you. So I mean, it's kind of like watching a good movie or a train wreck, right? If you feel that many emotions about it, um, I did. A, I decided I was going to do a Snapchat filter and be silly because I felt a little silly watching that debate with with just the ridiculousness of those candidates right now. Um, I think that it, you know, if this field doesn't get any better. Um, it's it's more than a shoe in for President Trump uh, in 2020. Um, <laughs> who else just jumped on? Guy, Guy Norenberg. So Guy is, um, we haven't met before, but um, if you guys pay attention to um, his uh, graphic artistry, he's um, he's pretty hilarious. So I want to talk to everyone. So welcome, Guy. It's great to see you. Um, guys, we've been getting some really amazing organic reach with, with our town halls. So if you can now, invite, um, invite your friends. Do a watch party um, because I really want to hear um, questions from not only you, but from your neighbors, your family, and your friends. So please invite them to these town halls. I do, guys. I want to talk to you a little bit about my week. Um, I've had a, a amazing, uh, amazing week. I like, as I mentioned, I was able to speak at the Antelope Valley Republican Assembly, um, who just had an amazing group. And Phyllis Wright, Riley is their feel, uh, fearless leader, and she really just um, runs a great meeting, and it was a great opportunity. Um, this past weekend, I had to go to. Um, I didn't have to, but I was very fortunate to have been invited by my good friend, um, Tony Kovarik over in San Diego, the, the Republican Party chairman, um, to attend their annual Republican um, Lincoln-Reagan dinner. 
and it was a truly a phenomenal event. There were over, I think there were over 800 Republicans um, who attended this, uh, this event. So, I mean, how amazing and great is it, is it to be in a room with, you know, 800 Republicans, you know, again, you don't always agree on everything, but um, I, I take that, you know, that group over any, any group any day. Um, so because I was already going to be down in San Diego and because I have really been yearning to get down to our southern border, um, Tony actually put me in touch um, with a few people um, down in San Diego, including a retired Border Patrol agent. Um, one of the reasons that I'm running or one of the issues that is a key issue for me is immigration reform and border security. And... Chris Harris, who was able to talk to me about um, the crisis at our, at our southern border right now, really reminded me, and it's something that I've talked about for years, um, but I haven't been as direct about this, is that, so one of my platform issues has been immigration reform and border security. And as Chris mentioned, these really are two separate issues. It's not that they don't overlap, but there are two separate issues that we really have to think about um, and we really have to reform and fund now. So one of the first things we talked about and, and, and Chris showed me um, was um, where we talked about border security. And guys, I knew that what was going on at the southern border is a true humanitarian crisis. I knew and thought that it was pretty bad and I've gotten, you know, pretty emotional about it because it really angers me that Congress has failed to fund our southern border. And this humanitarian crisis and our under-supported border patrol agents and our system, all of these, these things that are going on that are really atrocities are a result of an, a negligent Congress not willing to fund our southern border. I knew it was bad, guys. But let me just tell you, it is really, really horrific. Some of the stories, you know, every time I hear a new, a personal story about really what's going on there, um, it, it just, it angers me. And it angers me that our failed and our broken system is essentially encouraging and putting money into the pockets of cartels. The cartels are the only organizations winning right now. Americans are not win winning on the winning on this issue right now. Migrants are not winning on this issue right now. People are dying. They are living in filth. And it's because Congress has failed to fund our southern border. It is unacceptable. So what the key things that we need to do at our southern border right now is we need to I support 100% a safe, secure and modern border. We need to fund technology. So whether, you know, whether it's funding simple things like flashlights, you know, Chris was telling me that, you know, sometimes they don't have the most simple of technologies like, like flashlights. Um, we're, we may, we'll, we'll, and certain areas of the border, we'll need thermal imaging. We'll need aerial um, technology, drone technology. Um, it, technology and funding technology is a huge part of the solution. The second thing we really need to fund um, is is barriers, guys. And it's it's really funny, and I may not funny. I may take some flack for this, but before visiting um, Chris and hearing firsthand what border security's recommendation is and what they have been talking about with the Trump administration before before this, I would have said that I am behind um, supporting a wall and barriers. And people want that yes or no question. Do you support the wall? Well, if somebody were to ask me that a couple of weeks ago, I would have said yes. If somebody were to ask me that today, I would say no. I do not, I do not support a brick and mortar wall because what I support is barriers that allow visibility for border agents to see what is coming about at them. So guys, I really want you to know that I need you guys to start talking about this and talking about what it is the needs 
what the needs are of actual border patrol agents and what they need to be successful at our southern border to keep us safe. And the president, the Trump administration is advocating for the same thing. Um, so people trying to attack me on that, guys, I'm not going to have it because I'm doing what's best for our border patrol agents. And the last thing that, guys, that we need to fund um, is boots on the ground. It doesn't matter if we have technology. It doesn't matter if we have barriers. If we don't have somebody, uh, boots on the ground to intercept um, the, the, the things that are coming across the southern border. Right now, the minimum requirement that our the requirement of staffing that our border is supposed to have is about twenty one thousand um, twenty one thousand uh, agents, and right now there are two over two thousand agents short. Guys, this is a crisis, and you know the arg what's been going on the past couple of days. It just it makes me sick. Now, where this kind of overlaps into immigration reform is that the reason that we are seeing these huge influx of migrants coming to our country is because there's a loophole in our asylum and our asylum process and it's something that we need to bait we need to fix we need to close this loophole you know one of the big suggestions that i've been mulling with and i know you guys have lots of questions and and i'm gonna i'm gonna start answering them in just a minute um but before i move forward what I'm really starting to look at and advocate for um, is supporting that we train border patrol agents to be able to do asylum assessments at the border. Guys, we are completely overwhelmed. And unless we start um, training border patrol agents to really decide and find out, properly train, I'm, just, I'm not just saying that, you know, any, you know, any border patrol agent without the proper training um, and investigation training would make these decisions. But if we are um, investigating and actually finding out whether migrants at the border have a legitimate asylum claim and they're gonna be able to provide the document documentation required for to meet our standards of asylum, then that needs to be determined, determined at the door, at the border. And if they don't have that, then they need, need to be returned to their country of origin. I am, you know, it's, we're, we're, we just, we don't have the capacity to do anything more if we're not stopping it at the door, guys. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about immigration, but I'm going to get to some of your questions. Um, doo -doo -doo. Uh, out of the pack, Gayla's question, out of the pack, who would you pick if you had to? Out of... Out of what? Out of the Democrat pack? Oh man, that's a hard one. Um, who would I pick? Oh, I can't. It's like, it's yeah. I can't do it. I can't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I think. Think. Thank God I live in a country I get to where I get to vote for Republicans. <laughs> um. Choo-choo. Alex, Alex Vargas, so good to see you, and Matt. Uh, okay. Chris, Chris, welcome, and Rosanna, Rosanna, welcome so much. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so Chris has a question for me, and Chris says, running in a major primary, what is your strategy for handling, handling the mudslinging? <laughs> More importantly, the contest against the Democrat opponent. What is your strategy for handling Demo Democrats' predictable, dishonest attacks, which will be lodged against you and your family? Let me tell you, um, it's not easy, but I am a tough girl. I grew up with three brothers. Um, in high school, I played on an all-boy basketball team. I was the only girl. Um, I played varsity basketball and I'm, I'm short. I think I'm like five, five. Um, but when our center was out, I played center because I know I knew how to box out. I'm super competitive. I have thick skin. Um, and the way that I survive the attacks, um, is that if they're not true, they don't matter. And you can't care about what they say and you can't care about the mudslinging and you know part of my strategy is exactly what i'm doing right now is whether it's me being out into the being out in the community or having these facebook town halls my neighbors my constituents 
Um, the citizens of the 25th Congressional District will know me. They're getting to know me. And when you know somebody and you, you, you learn to trust them and their character. So part of the strategy is building relationships now. And, you know, politics, elections, and really anything, even in, 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 in the business world, it's all about relationship building. So part of my key is relationship building so people know who I am, they know, they know what I stand for. Um, myself knowing the truth um, and not, I mean, they're gonna probably make up a lot of, a lot of stuff and twist words, I get it. I, I saw, you know, Steve Knight had to deal with a lot of that. Even when I announced, guys, you know, the Twitter trolls are, and, and you know, Facebook trolls and social media trolls are really nuts like the things that they would say about me and about my family and it's just crazy and you can't watch you just you you can't let it bother you the hard I mean it's probably gonna be most hard for my husband um, really funny story guys he uh, when Shane and I met um, we met at a political event through his brother and um, I'm probably gonna give you guys a little bit too much information here but oh well I'm an open book um, uh, we met at a political event. I went to the bar to get a glass of champagne and Shane, I didn't know him at the time, was you know, s sitting at the bar to my left and he asked the bartender, oh, I'll have a, g a glass of champagne. So I'm like, oh, this guy, he's cute and he wants a glass of champagne. You know, come to find out, he's my friend's brother. So we go on the patio and it was a cigar mixer political event. So we're having champagne, we're smoking cigars and we're talking about politics and I'm like, this is a perfect guy. Like he likes champagne, cigars and politics, you know, come to find out, you know, after a year of dating, he hates politics. He hates cigars and he hates champagne. So <laughs> he's, you know, he's, he's, he's such a sweet part, but he hates politics. It's probably going to be a little bit harder for him. Um, but, but, um, you know, we're a team and he's super supportive. So that's a really, you know, long answer, but thanks for the question, Chris. Um, okay, Joe, Joe, welcome, and Joe, I'm going to kind of, you know, put you on the spot here a little bit. Um, Joe was so kind enough to have made a contribution to my campaign. I've known Joe for a long time, and guys, you know, we are up against a beast and a, you know, political fundraising beast as well. So I just want to ask that if any, you know, if you've been watching me and you've been reading my, my posts and my policy positions, um, and you think that what's important to me is also important to you, or if it resonates with you, or if you want to send somebody who shares your shared values to Washington, I need you to donate to my campaign. Um, we have a really important deadline coming up on June 30th. It's going to be my first filing. You know, any contribution that you can make, you know, five dollars, twenty dollars, please go to uh, www.suzettevaladeris.com and please make a donation. Again, any any amount it helps, and I'm sure um, Michelle will be able to post a link a link so please make a make a donation if you can and joe thank you so much for your don your donation your question is how can we fix the immigration issue wait a minute i just spent a long time on do you believe we should build the wall um i did just answer you know the wall question i won't go into that and how can we fix immigration obviously immigration is a huge um a huge issue as well and one of the not leading reasons that that there are undocumented immigrants in this country is because of, of uh, immigrants who fit documented immigrants who fail to keep up their their visas and and paperwork right so we have to find out a way um, to ensure that that doesn't happen um, and you know this you know whether it is you know creating a policy that you know could figure out a way to freeze um, monies or you know we, we just we really have to look into this issue but what I think is kind of more important in terms of fixing immigration reform is we need to assess our immigration needs and our visa needs annual biannually so maybe every congressional session because in some years California may need a lot of uh, manual laborers or people to work in our fields for our agricultural uh, um, industry and other years Silicon Valley may may need more 
um, individuals with those um, high tech type of jobs and, and experience. And this needs to be assessed, you know, probably biannually and our immigration reform should accommodate for that. We can't be stuck. Um, you, uh, our economy, our, um, uh, what we need changes so rapidly and we can't be stuck on just old immigration laws. And our immigration laws and even our asylum process is not working. Um, and it's creating in the asylum process specifically and the fact that we know that we hold people for 21 days and you know just the way that we're handing out handling our asylum process is creating um, this crisis so it's that's a huge part of immigration reform that we're gonna have to to tackle um, Rosanna thank you so much for being here good there pros guy 2000 2000 2000 uh, I may be like far behind you guys on these questions um, Rosanna, thanks for having me or being with me. As a Latino American, can you explain your stance on immigration? Oh my gosh, okay, we, well, as a Latino, that's a little bit different in that, la as a Latino American, can you explain your stance on immigration? I definitely consider myself, you know, an American above all. I happen to be on my mom's side of the family. Um, my grandmother was born in Mexico, my grandfather was born in Puerto Rico, um, and my mom was born in California. My dad's side of the family, his parents were born in um, Delano and De, um, in Arvin in Kern County. Um, his family actually came to the United States in 1917 um, and worked the fields um, pretty much. I think my grandmother worked the fields and moved to L.A. in the... the um, uh, mid 1950s um, so my family on my dad's side I'm, I'm what is that one two um, I think I'm fourth generation uh, Mexican on my on my dad my dad's side um, I also happen to have sister-in-laws who um, are in uh, well my my, my sister-in-law um, my oldest sister-in-law is an immigrant from uh, Mexico she came to the United States um, actually as a child with her parents legally and she, her parents um, applied for citizenship and were, um, were naturalized. Um, and Mireya, my sister-in-law, waited till she was an adult. So usually that right would be extended if you're a child and you're applying for citizenship and, you're, um, and your parents are citizens. Um, but because she waited until she was an adult, she had to go through the naturalization process herself. Um, so I also have, you know, my husband's family is from, from Guatemala and they actually have family in Spain too. Um, uh, whether it's individuals that I've worked with, um, I know a lot of people who are, I mean, we live in Southern California, right? I think we all know you can't live in even the 24th, 21st Congressional District and not know somebody who's migrated to this country, both legally and both illegally. So as a Latino, I know a lot of people who have come here legally who get very upset with people who are essentially trying to game a system or cut in line. As a matter of fact, I just had um, heard, um, read a post from a, um, a, a friend of mine who came here from Cuba and her parents, um, you know, her father was imprisoned in Cuba and her parents applied for asylum and it took them over nine years for that to be approved before they were able to come to the United States. And um, they get upset, and rightfully so, when people try and game the system and don't go through the proper channels. Um, so as a Latino, I think all Latinos believe in the rule of law. Um, and for Latinos who are in this country legally, um, we want to make sure that the laws are followed so that's kind of you know a roundabout um i guess answer um but really in it, i mean it's, i have a larger position that i just talked about for quite a couple minutes so i won't get back into that too much um steven hi it's good to see you i have some i have some paperwork for you i didn't forget i'll get i'll get that to you uh soon <laughs> that you know because everybody wants to know um, <laughs> Stephen, Stephen, if you had to vote for a Democrat, uh, if you had, if you had to vote for a Democrat president, who would it be? 
if I had to vote for a Democrat for president, who would it be? Well, it probably would have been um, Elizabeth Martinez, who is my mother and who was a Democrat. That's the only Democrat I'd support. <laughs> uh hector my cousin i think it's my cousin hector thank you for joining um <laughs> oh michelle my my cheerleader i love it yeah okay so Brittany, you also um Brittany, i love Brittany. you are amazing she's one of my uh my, my, my mama friends she happens to be a mama she happens to be a friend um you also don't want to pull a mitt romney though and not fight back even if the attacks aren't true, I think you should still address them and point out their flaws. Yes, you know, since a very young age, I've always been very opinionated and very talkative. And, you know, one of the stories I tell is about my very first experience with learning about speaking up and speaking out to get something done is um, back in 19, I think it was 1989. I was, I think it was in third grade. There was the Exxon Valdez mobile oil spill. I was in third grade, and I remember seeing, you know, these little birdies on on the beach. You know, their their wings were filled with oil. I remember the ocean life that you know was floating at the top of the ocean. Um, that oil spill really affected me, and I went back to school the next day, and I talked to my my teacher, Mr. Smith, who Mr. Smith were Facebook friends. So if you're on tonight. Um, say hi. Um, he he asked me, Suzette, well, what do you want to do about this? And I said, we need to write the president of the United States. And my entire third grade class wrote a letter to the president of the United States. It was um, George, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. And he wrote a letter back to us, or his secretary did. Somebody wrote a letter back to us. And it was then that I realized that when you see an injustice, you need to speak up. And whether that injustice is happening in my community or whether that injustice is happening to me, as in people making false accusations or people trying to, you know, box me into a corner, um, I will fight back and I will raise my voice. Um, I may um, often wear a smile on my face it's because I'm naturally a happy person, um, but I'm a fighter and I think I have a really great balance of competitiveness and cajones, um, and as well as compassion, um, which I think a lot of people in our district are looking for. They're looking for somebody who's gonna fight for them, but also be compassionate about the issues that are most important to them and wanna move policy that affects our district forward. Great question, Brittany. Phil, Phil, welcome. It is great to have you. Um, hi, Suzette. What's your response to the growing socialist movement? It's a wolf in sheep's clothing, particularly, ah, let me see. I'm trying to get um, the, the little, I can't see more of your question. Okay, particularly for people with higher financial need, it's a welcome change. How do you respond or what is your answer to this growing movement? I think that unfortunately there's a whole generation or two who don't necessarily understand what socialism truly is and how it is the antithesis of why our country was founded and directly contradicts our pillars of liberty and freedom. And when it comes to the growing acceptance of this movement, it, it scares me. I mean, I, I just didn't see a time in my life where we would be talking about this movement gaining any type of legs or traction. And really, one of the biggest advocates for, for um, democratic socialism happens to be a Latina. Oh, my dog Jax is here to say hi. Um, happens to be a lot, and he's gonna push me out of this, this, um, get down, bud. So AOC happens to be um, the poster child for democratic socialism right now. And that angers me because 
I have, you know, family that have come from Guatemala. I have friends that have come from Cuba, uh, Nicaragua. Uh, now what we're seeing in Venezuela, there are generations of people that have left communism and have left socialism to come to the United States of America for freedom and liberty. And that is not what socialism provides. It's an insult and a slap in the face to people who have come here to escape those things. And one thing that I've heard that is very similar, whether I also have an uncle who came um, from Eastern Europe, his family fled communism, is they say the same thing, that this movement can typically start off slowly, but then it rapidly, socialism specifically, starts off so slowly, but then rapidly turns into communism, turns into oppression, and even turns into genocide. This is un-American. I will never support that movement. And I think that we need to do a better job as conservatives, as, um, as even libertarians, as, as free market capitalists, to really start to teach our younger generation about about why our system has worked for so long? It's a really great question, thank you. Uh, and then yes, Michelle, thank you so much for um, adding that link again there, guys. Um, you know, the left is one, is when, we when conservatives recently have been talking about socialism and have been talking about, you know, the growing movement of democratic socialism, we often get accused of fear-mongering right? But it's anything but that. Are we afraid of socialism? Um, to some extent, yes, because we don't ever want to see it in our country. Um, but my point is, guys, that the left is going to start attacking conservatives who speak out against socialism. And if you believe that we need to empower conservatives and elect conservatives to go to Washington to represent our values and to combat socialist policy, which is what we are seeing in terms of the, the proposition of single payer or universal health care, which is what we are seeing when they're seeing, saying free college tuition for all. All of these things are socialist policies that we cannot afford and our country is going in the wrong direction if we start to think that we can't afford those and those are the right direction to go is absolutely not the right direction. And if you want to be a part of the movement that trounces democratic socialism, then I need you to donate to my campaign because you can believe me, this is something that I will speak up about and I will shout out at the mountaintops. Go to www, not four W's, SuzetteValderis.com to donate to my campaign. Michelle also put up a link here. Um, um, thank you so much for that question. Hector. Oh, thank you. Um... Okay, guys, I probably have time for um, one or two more questions before um, Jax jumps into my lap here. Um, Dan, Dan, the Second Amendment protects the rest. Um, I'm, maybe if you want to clarify what your question is there. Oh, oh, it's kind of more of a statement. Um, I, I can definitely agree with you that that's, you know, the, the Second Amendment is in... Um, our constitution um, for a reason, and you're right, it does protect our freedom and liberty, and I am a big supporter of the Second Amendment. Um, but if you have a, a more specific question, please let me know. Um, other than, if you guys saw, I'm trying to remember what Cory Booker's response was um, was today about needing a license to buy a firearm. Um, I believe in common sense background checks, um, 100%. I mean, we have a mental health issue. If you have mental health issues, um, you should not be able to own or purchase a firearm. I, I understand that. Um, but I think it's very ironic that, for instance, Cory Booker would want to require a license um, to, to, you know, uh, to buy a firearm um, when, and also in the same statement or, or, or stage, talk about wanting to protect 
um, um, the LGBTQ community and um, women, right? Well, if if the LGBTQ community and if women um, felt more comfortable and um, with guns, and if I, if, if as a woman I owned a gun, I do own a gun. If I could carry it, guess what? No, nobody's messing with me or taking advantage of me. And clearly, they're not. They're not going to at home by by any means as well. Um, so I'm, I think that you know the Second Amendment and and gun rights are also a woman's issue. And um, I, we got to get her on here one day. But there is um, Nikki with Pink Pistols, or, or Pretty Pink Pistols, or. Well, anyways, it's a it's a nonprofit organization, and um, Nikki, who happens to be transgender, um, goes out and teaches the LGBTQ community about the importance of their Second Amendment rights and how to defend themselves and promotes gun ownership. So it's a really great organization that I support, and I you know support it one hundred percent because I, I agree with her. If um, if the LGBTQ community is being attacked and threatened and abused. Um, Guess what? If they own guns, their guns for their own personal protection, not gonna happen. Um, I have time for one more question. I'm sure there's one down here. Um, oh, Brittany, just want to say you have my vote and I support you 110. percent Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Hey guys. Oh, so Jeremiah, um, we need a license to conceal carry across state lines. That's the only license, okay? <laughs> Maybe, is that what Cory Booker was trying to say? You, you should ask him. I doubt it. Um, but it's going to be really interesting to see, guys. Um, I think you have, you know, what is it, five more days to go by uh, ammunition. Well, there's a lot of gun laws that are changing in California or being implemented, I should say, in California on July 1st. Um, so make sure that you're looking at those. And I'm hoping to see that a lot of those laws get challenged. Um, I think, you know, I, I just as many laws as we have Cal in here in California in regards um, to, to gun control, I just it, it baffles me when they find another way to slap another layer of, of, of gun control regulation on us. But part of my excitement in going to Washington to be your congresswoman is that when I'm elected, I'm going to be, first of all, I'm going to be having these town halls with you every Wednesday. I'm going to be in the district every week. I'm going to be listening to you constantly to keep my pulse on what is going on in the district. This is home for me. This is where Charlotte is going to grow up. This is where I grew up. Being here is just is so important to me. And uh, when I go to Washington, I don't just want to be a good legislator, but guys, I also want, I'm a Californian, and I, I want to pass good federal legislation that um, that promotes our freedom and liberty here, here in California and protects all Americans. Um, but I also want to be super active in supporting Republicans here in the 25th Congressional District and across California. Um, we know and we understand that the one-party system in California is not working. And I commit to be a part of changing that tide um, because we have to, because if, if we, even though we are federal legislators, we have to play and support our state legislators, our city council members, our water board members, because when we don't, this is where we end up. We end up with only seven congressional Republicans representing the state of California. When I first got super active in Republican politics, politics we had 24 Republicans. Last cycle, we lost seven Republican Congress uh, men and women here in California. Completely unacceptable, guys. We have to take back our state. We have to save California. And this is a top targeted race. The NRCC, the National Republican Congressional Committee, has targeted this seat. Katie Hill is vulnerable because she doesn't vote her district values. Katie Hill is a placeholder for Suzette Martinez Belladares. But guys, I need your support. Again, please donate $5. 
um, $20. The maximum donation um, that you can donate for a couple is $5,600, $2,800 a person. Um, um, please go to my website to donate. If you won the lottery, please max out to me. Consider maxing out to me. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining me on my sixth um, Facebook town hall. I will see you guys next week for lucky number seven and hopefully have some great updates on the campaign and also reach out to me during the week. If any of you want to host a coffee, um, invite some of your friends to come learn more about me. I'd be happy um, um, to come do that with you. Uh, I will be at the um, Santa Clarita 4th of July parade in the morning in Santa Clarita um, and some other and another event in Simi Valley, Lancaster in Acton. So there's another opportunity for you guys to see me. But until then, you may be able to catch some of that wonderful Democratic presidential debate. Until then, I'll see you guys next week.